I feel like I was a master of communication and a master of relationships until I went through menopause. Hmm. Hmm. And then as my hormones started to change, I felt like I was reading people differently, hmm. uh, relationships that no longer were working for me. I, I, wa I just wasn't willing to put effort into them. And some relationships that have had kind of just weren't giving me that same juice. I needed to redesign. So can you give us, I'm hoping this will be like a yes. masterclass on relationships. Yes. Dr. Mindy here. Your body is in a, in a war zone. This is different yes. parts of the brain get activated depending upon how stressed you are. When you look at it from that inflammatory. It's interesting. I mean, that has some merit to it for sure. And you can't control everything. Yeah, I'd say. And what about the uh, a woman who is not pregnant, but she's aiming? Okay, so we're going to dive in, and the first thing I I have to do is welcome you to my podcast, Karen. <laughs> I, you and I have had so many great discussions. We're now bringing those great discussions to the world, right. so thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, and I'm like so excited. I get to kind of like talk to my friend for like the next hour. Like, how, how fun is that? It's like a, it's like a right. girl's party. It's like a girl's party with a yeah. whole bunch of other people. Yeah, so good. That's right, and, and we get to call this work. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Cool. Well, I always, and my audience knows this, that uh, when I bring a guest on and we start a conversation, I'm always thinking through the lens of like, what help is needed for specifically women right. between the ages of 40 and 60. Although we do have, you know, couples, uh, heterosexual couples, you know, so men do venture into this podcast. Yeah. So we have same sex. I mean, the point is that we have all varieties in here, but the main is 40 to 60 year old women. And I'm just going to be very transparent and I, and maybe the other women listening are like, yeah, she knows me. Um, I feel like I was a master of communication and a master of relationships until I went through menopause. Hmm. Hmm. And then as my hormones started to change, I felt like I was reading people differently hmm. Uh, relationships that no longer were working for me. I, I, wa I just wasn't willing to put effort into them. And some relationships that have had kind of just weren't giving me that same juice. I needed to redesign. So can you give us, I'm hoping this will be like a yes. masterclass on relationships. Yes. What's the lens in which we can successfully look through relationships, no matter how intimate or how, if it's a work relationship, Give us a formula so we can succeed at our relationships. It's such a good question, Mindy. And I mean, there's so many variables, right? So it's interesting because you're talking about the physical changes, which is a huge piece. Yeah. Also, in your evolution and your own journey, you've got your career is changing, your, you know, yep. your business is changing. There's a lot of kind of variables. And so a lot of times people are like, okay, what is it? Is it hormones? right? Is it hormones or is it, you know, is it some of these other variables? And I think regardless with where people are at, I think it's really important to think about just like our bodies are changing, our relationships are going to change. You know, it actually only, it actually always concerns me a little bit when people say, oh, you know, they changed. I'm like, I hope so. Right. I hope that the person <laughs> that they were at 21 is not the person that they're actually at 51. Like, I always kind of find that a very strange, so well said. right? A kind of a strange kind of concept. It's like, I hope we've changed. I hope we've kind of evolved. And then, so I think it's really important for all of us listening is to really think about, let's get a framework on healthy relationships. Okay. And yes. so whether or not we're 40, 45, we're 30, uh, whether or not we're in a relationship or not in a relationship, let's understand what does a healthy relationship actually look like and actually kind of dive in to that. Right. And so Love it. Is that good? Okay. So you know this, but just for your for your uh, listeners. So I wrote a book called The Three Chairs. Um, this concept, this framework, okay, I'm going to be teaching you wanted a relationship masterclass. So this can be kind of like a framework on it. I came up with this concept, Mindy. I mean, you know the story. When I was like in my second year of practice, you know, I've done... I've had a family practice for over 25 years. I worked on leadership development like like 20 years. This concept came up with teenagers. So for anybody who is a parent, you're going to actually really value this. Mm. And but it's so simple and such a great framework that you can actually apply it to all these other parts of our life. So, you know, if people have seen my TED talk, you'll kind of know it, but very quick just high level. There's basically three chairs and this is all based on science. There's basically three chairs and it's all based on science that all of us sit in one of these chairs. So the left chair sits in, you know, that's the person that, you know, they put themselves down. They're really tough on themselves. They're critical. They can be the imposter syndrome. 
The person on the right chair has, uh, they're arrogant, they're cocky, they're full of themselves. They have what they call the disguised attitude. And then the person mm. in the middle has what we call the confident mindset. And that is a person that they feel good about themselves. They don't feel like they're less than, but they don't feel like they're better than other people. So mm. understanding the three chairs is really simple. Where it gets super interesting is understanding how we move between the chairs. So, yeah. okay, so let me ask you, putting you on the spot for a second. High yeah, school, no right? High, high school, where would you have sat? Oh, I was in the far left one. I was in the really? imposter syndrome. Okay. Yeah, not, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, and so what would you have done? Like, what would I have seen you do that would have told me that? Did you, like, what, what were the behaviors oh, that you did? Well, you could have just looked at my body language okay. and you would have seen. I mean, I know we could say, well, I was a teenager, but right. I just didn't. I Because I, my sister yes. sat in the far right chair. Okay. So she was cocky and arrogant and very capable. And older and, or younger? And older or younger? Older. Older. Wow. Yeah, okay. Older. Yep. So I sat in the other chair yep. and, and, and compared myself to her. Got it. And honestly, this is where... Uh, sibling dynamics, family of origin work is actually really interesting because if it's an older sibling, same gender, that is, is that's the dynamic that is only probably going to yeah. reinforce this. Yeah. Right. Because a yeah. lot of, a lot of younger siblings want their approval for their older siblings, especially when it's same gender. Yes. Right. Yes. The other thing, the other thing that I think is interesting is when you're the second, when you're a younger child, yes. you, you, I watched how the world didn't really take too kindly to her. And mm. I was like, well, uh, she's not like her arrogance and her abruptness is not getting her a lot of favor. So I'll be the other way. Oh, wow. But in okay. being the other way, I, I turned humbleness into insecurity and wow. not speaking up when I want to speak up. Okay. Okay. So this is because I find it's really helpful when I teach these concepts to teach the framework so we can kind of intellectually figure it out. And then use examples so that we can actually figure out how this actually plays out. Okay, so then that's in, that's as a teenager. So then, when you got into your twenties and thirties, when did you kind of move? What was kind of like your next kind of stage of evolution? Um, you know, it, this is such a great, interesting story. Do you know that literally it was the day I sat in an anatomy class? Wow! I in college, I sat in an anatomy class, and on the very first lecture, I was so fascinated hmm. by learning human body anatomy. I never looked back and I became obsessed wow. with understanding the human body. And once I found that passion for hmm. learning the human body, I, I probably go in, went into the middle chair, huh. um, but I definitely came out of that far left chair of imposter syndrome. Wow. I had found my thing. So do you think yeah. that is for you? And this is, again, just the takeaways for your audience. Are you thinking that finding your purpose helped yes. propel you? That was one of the, because there's yes. lots of different ways. There's lots of different ways that people can move into different chairs, but finding our purpose and our goals and identify your goals is one of the most effective ways to get to our middle chair. So I love the fact that you actually shared that. Okay, yeah. so that's real. Yeah. Okay, so then you're now in the middle chair. You're in anatomy class. And then when was your next kind of evolution with this? Do you feel like you've kind of stayed there? Do you feel like you have, you know, through menopause, perimenopause, that's actually changed? Or what's been kind of like your next evolution with Ooh. this? I know I'm totally well, putting so, you on the spot. No, this hey, is good. Hey, I hey. mean, people who follow me are going to be really, <laughs> you're going to hear a whole new side of me, but that's okay. I've been, I've been really, and I've been really in the last two years doing a lot of therapy, a lot of work on yep. myself. So it's really good just to talk about this. Um, I don't think I ever sat in the arrogant cocky okay. chair. Okay. Ever. I don't think I've ever sat there. Um, and I would say, I'd like to say I sit in the middle chair, which maybe you can describe a little more for everybody, just like what that middle chair is yep. like, because I've sure. heard, I've heard you talk about this before. Okay. But the, to answer your question, very interesting. In, this is brand new. I've kind of fallen back huh. into that left chair and um, I'm not sure why. I mean, I think hmm. what happens as you, as you sort of get more successful, especially in this last year, we've had such a huge, um, influx right. of opportunities. And there's like 350,000 people have already bought the book in nine months. Wow. And like, like just the podcast I've been on, there are moments of imposter syndrome mm. and it's a little bit like, wow, all I wanted to do is write a book to change lives. I had no idea the world would take it and fly with it mm. to this degree. And so you kind of don't keep up with your own growth is sort of how I've felt it. Wow. Woo. 
Oh there my God! There you There's go, the authentic Mindy. Wow, <laughs> Mindy, yeah. I love that. So, okay, so just so I'm so I'm clear. So, teenager anatomy class, and then when you started your practice, you would say for the most part, oh, middle chair, middle chair. Yeah, middle so, chair. middle chair, like like yeah. you were saying that you said you were a master because I'm just kind of like tying this all together, right? So, you said you're a master yeah. at relationships, master at communication. That's the middle chair, and I'll come back and be kind of defining yeah. it. And then as you've kind of hit this next wave of success you kind of like see yourself slipping back over there yeah yeah wow because you yeah yeah just because I, I you just when things move really fast there's a lot of change in your life you every just things feel really un, uncertain un, and unknown now i will say that the, the place that cockiness shows up for me i'm just going to call it that yeah that last year yeah is uh when you put me on charge of someone's healing journey I have no oh. doubt. I, I I am like a dog on a bone. I will figure out how to help that person heal. Hmm. And I feel really certain and cocky when it comes into that one-on-one -on -one coaching. Hmm. Do you think it's cockiness or do you just think it's certainty? I don't know. Oh, it's certainty. So yeah. I don't know. I, I, I don't, I don't know a... if there's probably. Yeah. No, but that's a really good question because I think as women, we don't own our, our certainty. Yes. And we. And, and so there is a little bit of our certainty comes across as looking cocky. Mm. So that might even just be things for me to work on. Yeah. And the other thing I was thinking of, Mindy, when you were talking about this is, okay, so you kind of, again, when you're talking about your evolution, so sitting here and then as the success kind of slipping back here, but to your point, you're also in peri perimenopause, menopause, correct? So now yeah, we've I'm got- I'm actually post-menopause Are you post-menopause? Okay. It's yeah. official. Okay. It's official. <laughs> I'm in the perimenopause. And let me yes. tell you, it is wild. It's quite the Ooh, adventure. It's wild. It's a, it is such the adventure. Because what I'm thinking is, you know, this is where, you know, our physical changes are so interesting with our relationships and our mindset is that when we're going through, I mean, I can only speak for myself through perimenopause, everything is really heightened. My emotions That's are it. very heightened. The way I see things. Like I'll interpret things and my husband will be like, I really think they just meant this. Like, I think you're totally yes. personalizing this. So like, I feel like, Ooh, like I had this armor yes. on before that I don't like, it's like, okay, I need to yes. reestablish. And that's where the physical part, right. Kind of inter intertwines, right. For with our overall yeah. mindset. So so in answer, yeah, um, go can ahead. I, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Can I say something on sure. that? Because I think this is a beautiful marriage between your yes. work and my work. Yes. And this is why, again, people who have been listening to me um, on a regular basis, that they are going to sort of know what I'm about to say. And if this is brand new, hopefully this will enlighten you. But it is an armor that gets shed when mm -hmm. we go through perimenopause. So we lose two key hormones. We lose estradiol and progesterone. But in the loss of those two hormones, mm. we can lose serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine, oxytocin, BDNF. Like these are massive neurochemicals in our in, that stimulate our brain. Mm -hmm. So you do feel more sensitive. Mm -hmm. I remember going through periods in my perimenopausal years where I felt like paranoid. Mm. And I thought, oh my God, I never feel paranoia. Mm. So I think there's something really mm -hmm. interesting about this three chair concept and learning how to move through it for the perimenopausal woman. Yes. Because we don't feel like ourselves yeah. because of the shedding of this neurochemical armor. Right. And I think that's so well said. And that again, this is why I love that intersection of the work that both of us do, because, you know, when you're talking about moving to that left chair, and talking about the success and the success would be for sure one of the variables, right? Like there's lots of variables. That's one of the yes. variables. And then we've got physical changes that are actually also happening as well. And so sometimes we're like, okay, we, what is it? Is it the success? Is it a body changes? Look. Is it kind of a combination of both? I find a lot of times it's a combination of both, but regardless, we need to have tools, right? I mean, it, bottom yes. line, I always want yeah. anybody that I'm speaking to, conferences, media, whatever, to make sure, okay, what are the tools that we can actually do to help? Yeah. And I, I want to point one other thing out yep. because this is another, for the for people listening, it's also loss of identity. Mm. So think about that as you go through the 40 and 40-year-old mm. sort of transition in perimenopause, like your body's feeling different, your kids are have maybe grown up and are out of the house, so your identity as a parent is yes. different. Yes. Um, a lot of women are going back into the workforce. 
uh, women like me are changing, dramatically changing yes. our careers. So it's that loss of identity that I think can sit you back mm. in that left chair mm -hmm. where you're like, what am I doing? Why mm -hmm. am I doing it? Like all that certainty is mm -hmm. gone. Mm -hmm. And you know what makes me think about a conversation I had with um, a woman entrepreneur this morning. And to your point, she had, she sat in the middle chair for most of her life. Then she realized that it, she's now kind of coming up in 50, that her life does not align to her values. Yeah. And she wants to do yeah. something different. So now she's made the decision to do something different. But in that decision, she feels like, whew, it's like all of a sudden yes. she's in a new arena. She's in yes. a new arena, new skills, new framework, new people, new tools. And it's kind yes. of a bit of, so it sounds like a little bit like with you, just that evolution yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of women I've spoken yeah. with, you know, we kind of had, um, after our, our, you know, our, you know how, when you're, you're friends a lot with the families that your kids are friends yes. with. Yes. And then once everybody was launched into the world, I feel like there was like a community of us that were mm. left like licking our wounds. Cause we were like, okay, kids are launched. Right. Careers are changing. We're yes. at home with our spouse, with nobody around. Like there's so much identi identity yes. Yes. shift yep. that it's really easy to fall back into that that chair that mm -hmm. you don't feel as good about yourself because the ground in which you were standing mm. on has dramatically shifted. Mm -hmm. I think that's so well said. And so this is where there's kind of like two parts that I think are really important to highlight. One is like just really helping everybody like, okay, how do I sit in that middle chair, right? Because this is yeah. learned. This is not genetic. A lot of people think it's genetic and it's not. It's there's, there's parts that will impact it, but we can all choose. And I think that's such a hopeful message, right? For all of us. Yes. So I, I think it's really important that we talk about that and how can we help ourselves in, and then how does it affect relationships and communication? So, right. okay, so let's talk about how to help people in the middle chair. So the middle chair are people who feel confident about themselves. They feel a sense of, I am enough. I think that's a really important message, right? I am enough. I am enough as I am that if I get this level of success, that's great, but my self-worth is not based on the success. Yeah, dive in a little bit more on the qualities of the middle chair. Sure. Because... Um, when I first heard you explain this, yeah. what, where I, and this was like six months ago. So I was in the middle of all this transition mm. in my life. And I remember thinking, oh, I know at, in the core of my heart, I want to show up as a middle chair person. Right. And, and that is who I'm dedicated to being. Right. Um, and so I just want everybody to hear what that yes. is, because I think that alone became mm. a target for mm. me and a remembrance that, hey, your value system says middle chair is mm. what is important to you when mm. it comes to dealing with other humans. Ooh, so good. Okay. So the qualities of the middle chair. So it's a person. So all it is, it's a mindset. Okay. So we were really just kind of like break it down. It's the thoughts that are inside of our head. We all have mind right. talk, right? We all have cognition. We all have like things that are inside of our head. It's the thoughts that we tell ourselves, and what, what we tell ourselves will impact how we feel which will impact our behavior. So it's like a domino effect. So when people talk about healthy yep. mindset, there's a reason for it. But this isn't like fluffy psychology. This is like, this is true and proven and science backed up, right? So so the th so one of the key thoughts that a person has in that middle chair is I am enough, period. So a person in the right chair is I'm enough if. Mm. I'm enough if I get 350,000 book sales. I'm enough if I get you know, 30 podcasts. I'm enough if, and the second we put that little word if, what happens is a person's like, <gasps> so it tends to be highly correlated with anxiety, massively correlated with anxiety. Mm. And a lot of wow. times they also, uh, they a lot of times struggle with perfectionism. So we see this actually. So what's interesting about the left chair is uh, if people can look like they're in the middle chair, right? They can be a high performer. They can be on stage. They could be like, you know, selling millions of books and doing movies and blah, blah, blah. But it's what they're really telling themselves inside their own head that really kind of determines. And nobody right. else can tell. Like, I couldn't tell you what chair you said and you would have to kind of say and vice versa, right? So so that's that's a really important thing is I am enough, period. So the the person on the chair that feels more insecure, what, yes. get, what is that the left chair or the right chair? Just that so is the left chair. So the person okay. in the left chair, so yeah. The, yeah. They feel insecure so, but when they get a big win, now they 
feel secure. So they're always looking for that. Like it, describe that yeah, a little so bit Yeah, so what happens is their thought pattern, and we see this with a lot of perfectionists and high performers, is they tell themselves, I'm okay if, fill in the blank, I lose this weight, I get a partner, I get this job, I make this amount of money, I get a promotion. So if they actually get it, they'll right. get like a little bit of a hit, like, like, woo! Yeah. And, then it'll, and then it'll be gone. Yes. It's true. And yes. then, okay. and then the panic starts going, holy crap, I got to now kind of get the next one. So it's not, right. so what's interesting when I work with a lot of high performers in this, they're like, no, no, I don't want to let go of this because I think this has actually helped me succeed. You know, like I feel like it's actually helped. I don't want to let go of it, Karen, yeah. because I really think that this has propelled me. I'm like, no, no, no. You just watch. Watch what happens when you move yourself into that middle chair because when people move themselves in that middle chair, they still go after their big goals, but without the anxiety. So, okay, this is brilliant. And I hope people listening are, are resonating with this. So I came, it was my 54th birthday on Sunday. And I had, it was the first number of all the birthdays that I was like, oh my God, like, how did I get here? Mm. And what am I doing? Like, I literally last week, you can ask all my closest <laughs> friends, I walked around going, what's the meaning of life? I don't get the meaning <laughs> of life. But here's right, why, right. And here's what I came to, was I think I, ha I can sit in that left chair mm. and when I get the if, mm. when it shows up, it doesn't have the same level mm. of satisfaction as I dreamed it to be. Wow. And so then I go searching for something else and I've been doing this my whole adult life. Wow. So last week I got a hold of that and I was like, I'm done doing that. I'm not chasing the dopamine. I'm right. not chasing the if. So if I'm not chasing the if, what am I doing? And that's where I was left. Wow. So I think, I think you have to redefine your purpose, Mindy. Yeah. And that's where the middle chair might be yes. helpful. Yes. Because that's a big game. And I hope everybody listening yes. gets this. Yes. Like that, I will be happy when. I will be worthy yes. when. That is a, and I'm just going to swear because this is my fucking podcast, <laughs> but I, like that is a fucking lie that so many of us have been agreeing with. Right. And it literally was last week that I broke that thing wow. open and I was like, you're done, done with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so do you feel like a sense of a little oomph? Do you feel like, do you feel like you're a little bit close to the middle chair? Just kind of like letting go of that. It's like, I'm done with that. Like I'm done with the if. Yeah. Oh, it's good. Yeah. But, it, but, yeah, but let's speak to, you know, women that, that may be resonating with yes. us, women or men. There's no neural pathway to understand how to do it differently. So mm. if I go back to my neuroscientist brain, yeah. when you've been doing something like set a goal, chase a goal, accomplish a goal, you're worthy. There's a neural network in your brain that's going to keep, that's going to feel very normal. Yes. So the minute you say, I am not my successes, I am not what my, the outcome of my children, I am not, right, right. you know, the, the number on a scale when you, whatever it is, the minute you decide that that's not going to dictate your worthiness. Yes. You you don't have the neural pathway to think differently, mm. which is why I'm, ho and, and that's what, so I felt a little lost, mm. but I was clear that I wasn't playing that game anymore. So mm -hmm. I, I feel like the middle chair, the qualities that you'll are going to teach us about yep. the middle chair could really help create a new set of yes. neurons in my brain yes. to think of this differently. Yes. Oh, so good. It's so good, Mindy. Okay. So, um, in terms of the neural pathways, yes. So our brain, okay, so we let, let's just back up. So in terms of the qualities of the middle chair, just we're all kind of on the same page, qualities yes. of the middle chair. The person in the middle chair, they their, their fundamental thought pattern is I am enough, okay? Right. Period. There's no if. Um, I may right. want a goal, but my self-worth is not based on the goal, okay? So it's kind of right. like in the left chair and the right chair, actually, a person's like a little bit of a puppet. They're like a little bit of a puppet. And when you're in the middle chair, you're kind of like cutting all the strings. It's like, no more. I'm not going to do that. Like I'm yes. enough. I'm like yes. going to cut out the strings and I'm going to sit here because I'm enough. And that's it's period. End of story. So that's kind of like the biggest issue or the biggest kind of thing that would be different out of that because the person then feels or really believes that as a result, their feeling is they tend to feel more confident. They feel mm -hmm. worthy. They feel mm. secure. 
um, there is a sense of peace, actually. There's a sense mm. of peace that they will actually feel. Um, and because they feel that, they tend to actually kind of, it comes out in their behavior. So common things that we see in actions, okay? So, you yes. know, so it's like cognitive emotional behavior. That's kind of like fancy word. I call the thoughts, feelings, and the actions, okay? So think of it like a domino effect. So the, the actions are people in the middle chair, they tend to, they still set goals and you can still be a massive high performer. But the difference is I'm going to give it everything I've got and then I'm going to accept whatever my best is. Mm. So they yep. tend to strive for excellence, not perfection. And so are they looking, is the journey more important than the end result? Like they set the goal, but then they're, they're really trying to uh, enjoy and use their creative abilities or what, you know, their, their brilliance in the yes, journey. Yes. Yes. And I think it's like, they really see themselves as like, yeah, a journey they're evolving, they're changing. And it's like, what is important to me? They have a really solid sense of self. They have a very right. clear vision around this is my vision for my life. This is with what's important to me. These are the values that I want to live my life by. And I'm going to step on the gas. I'm yes. going to step on the gas. And I think I can, uh, that is really helpful because the one thing, once I decided I didn't want to, you know, play the game of the left chair, yep. I I realized, oh, I do have a value system I can always come back to. Yes. And so I, what I'm hearing from you right now is I was, I mean, so I did move that, I would say today with the person you're talking to yep. is in the middle chair. Right. Because, but I had to really see the ugliness yes. of the left chair and where it didn't serve me. Yes. And so that is exactly, okay, so that is, so that is kind of foundational in terms of like what we, when we think about that kind of middle chair, we call it, there's actually five core skills, okay? There's five core skills for somebody who's in the middle chair. We call it the acronym CARDS, right. okay? So it's built on emotional intelligence, basically, okay? There's five core skills. We've got a fabulous scorecard on our website, dkleadership.org. People can download it Perfect. for free. Um, and org in Canada is is not a nonprofit. I get asked that all the time. It's like, oh, is that? Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, <laughs> dkleadership.org, O-R-G. So people can get it. They can download it. But it's a it's a scorecard that helps you to measure the five core skills. So cards, I like acronyms. It helps me kind of understand content. So, yes. so uh, there's five things that it really measures. C stands for your communication skills. Mm. A stands for your attitude and goal setting skills. R stands for your relationship skills. D stands for your decision-making and time management skills. A lot of people don't realize that, that actually impacts it. And S Ooh. measures your stress and emotion management skills. So these are the five core um, emotional intelligence skills. And depending on where people sit, will actually determine. So if people do the scorecard, they will actually, they might like be crushing three out of the five. Okay, they might be they might be doing really well in communication and goal setting and relationships, but they're they suck at time management and stress, mm. right? Or yeah. vice versa. Um, and so, what's really important is for all of us to kind of almost have a bit of a, a self awareness around. Okay, uh, let's do the scorecard. Let's measure it. Let's figure out of these five core skills, where am I sitting in the middle chair for which for which skill? Mm -hmm. And I kind of like outline oh. exactly, I outline exactly because of the five skills, we might be four of them in the middle chair and one of them were over here. Ah, uh, so you can sit differently oh. with different, at different times. In different times and different, and different environments. So Mindy, people can be like in the middle chair at work and they go home and they sit in the left chair. Interesting. Or people can okay. sit in the middle chair at work and home and then they go see their family of origin and all of a sudden they go back to the left chair. Wow. Oh yeah. It's so it's, so if I take if I take yep. this quiz, it'll yep. tell me where I sit with these five things. It will it will show you, it will show you how you're doing in all five of those skills and where are you scoring really well and which ones actually need work. Yes. It's right. Okay. Perfect. And so it it's a really great because I find a lot of times when I teach this the framework, people are like, Oh, I love this, but I want to I want to go deeper and I want to actually understand how am I according to these kind of skills. So the first thing right. is, again, understand the mindset, understand then the five core skills. And then, and then once we kind of like go a little bit deeper, we can start kind of playing out how the chairs really impact behavior. So you talked about gotcha. relationships. Okay. So relationships is one of the five. Okay. So uh, it's the, the third uh, category. So 
Uh, we talked about friendships, dating, relationships. I think your, your listeners are going to find this super interesting. Okay, great. Where we sit highly impacts who we are attracted to for yeah. friendship and relationship partner. So we see That's with crazy. research, isn't this crazy? We see with research that if I'm sitting in that left chair, it doesn't matter if I'm 13 or 50. If I'm sitting in that left chair, there's a higher chance I'm going to be attracted to unconsciously to somebody who actually sits in the right chair or the left chair. We don't, wow, okay. Isn't that so crazy? The right, yes. The right chair, just explain the right chair for a moment. Right chair, so they are, they're, they're cocky. They almost appear uber confident, okay? They, they're, they're a bit cocky. They're arrogant. Um, they, they have a superior attitude. So when it comes to conflict, they're not going to apologize. It's all your fault. They're not going to take any ownership. They, uh, they have it. They feel like they're superior. This left person feels they're inferior and this person feels like they're equal. So the inferior would, that would make sense. You would attract the superior to make yourself feel more superior. Right. And the superior unconsciously looks for the inferior to elevate them. Oh, to make, continue to make them feel. Yes. Oh, fascinating. Okay. okay well, what happens yes. if you make a, a, a marriage choice yes. at t- 20? Yes. Yes. This is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about when people say, mm-hmm. oh, they've changed. So let's play this out. So let's say, again, somebody's 20 years old. They get married. They marry their partner. They're over there. They're like, holy crap. This isn't feeling good. But all of a sudden, let's say they're on a personal discovery journey. So now they're going to, they're going to take books. They're going to listen to fabulous podcasts like yours. They're going to read, you know, read books and attend seminars, maybe do therapy. And all of a sudden they get themselves to that middle chair. Well, what's going to happen is there's going to be massive conflict. Yes. Yes. And what will happen is, um, and I'll tell you a story actually, it was funny. So I was doing a parenting conference. I mean, I do mostly leadership and business uh, and educational conferences. And this one actually was an educational conference. This is like years ago. And I had a couple that was sitting front row, Mindy, and they were frantically taking notes. And I was explaining the three chairs. And afterwards, the couple comes up to me. They're like, oh my God, I'm listening to you. And I'm like listening to everything that you're actually saying. And we came here to understand our children and our whole marriage is now in front of us. And they basically said that when we got married and, and the guy, the guy was actually telling me this. He goes, I, my wife was sitting there. I was sitting there. I said, so what happened? She goes, well, she moved to the middle. I said, then what happened? He goes, she said, you come to counseling or we're done. I'm not going to put up with this. I'm not going to put up with your, with your, this not like this nonsense anymore. So he said, yeah, fine, I'll go. So she put her foot down. She now understands she is worthy and she's not going to put up with it. And that changed the whole dynamic. He got himself to counseling. And I said, I'm like listening to them. And like, this is crazy. And I said, so where do you sit now? He goes, I see us both sitting in the middle chair. And I see all three of our daughters sitting in the middle chair. And so, so if we were to gamify this, the yes. goal is for everybody to get to the middle chair. Yes. If we can get to the middle chair, now we're having really healthy interactions Now we're having healthy, each other. right. And so it's, it is always, so for example, if I'm coaching a client and they want to get themselves to a middle chair and they're single, I tell them, hold off on the dating scene. Let's yes. get you to that middle chair and then I will help you I will help you on that dating scene. Do not date until you're in that middle chair because if you're not in that middle chair, you're going to be attracted to people in that right chair. So, so smart. Isn't that interesting? So, so yeah. that's how it affects relationships and, you know, uh, dating <clears throat> as it relates to friendship. So we've, you and I have talked about this before, how as women, women friendships are amazing and they can be tricky. Yes. And um, you and I have had many conversations about this. And so as we evolve and we grow and hopefully we get ourselves that middle chair, what we see as a healthy friendship is going to look very different. Yes. If we're in that yes, left chair. It does. So the same thing happens in friendship. If I'm sitting in this chair, I'm going to be unconsciously attracted to people and friends who sit here or here. If I'm yes. sitting in this chair, I'm unconsciously going to be attracted to people who actually sit here. It makes so much sense. Yes. And I, and I'm thinking of all the f- relationships I have in my life that maybe I, like aren't what I, they used to be. And what I'm realizing is, oh, I switched chairs on Yes. Them. Yes. And you I changed the dynamic. Them. You, cho- you changed yeah. the dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you do? Let, I mean, and this is going to be both in friendships and in marriage, like 
so you switch you switch the chair yep and the other person's not really wanting to switch the chair or maybe you're in a friendship like I can think of some of my friends that I'm gonna yeah. like send them this podcast and be like hey you should listen to this let's have a talk <laughs> let's talk about what chair you're in because I think it will it will deepen our relationship yes. but I, but I think some people would be like not everybody wants to get to the middle chair yeah, no, I think that's a great point, Mindy. And I think that's where I actually do a friendship audit every year. Mm. Every year. I kind What's of that? so the friendship audit is what are my core values that I look for uh, in a friend? What are my core values? And then I look at the people that I've very carefully chosen. I'm very careful with who I surround myself with. Me and too. Pat and you too. And yeah. I make sure that I am constantly aligning and choosing friends that are aligned with my value system. So is that because it's so easy to get knocked out into one of the other chairs is what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah. And I think my value system has changed, right? Like, um, mm. you know, as I've kind of helped myself kind of move to that middle chair. And if you, people have seen my TED talk, I sat in that left chair for a long, long time. And yeah. so- when I kind of help myself move to that middle chair, one of the first things I did is actually try to find friends in the middle chair. Yeah. And I think, yeah. And, and then I think as women, if, if people have any level of success, women who sit in that middle chair, uh, they will champion other women who are successful. Yeah. Boy, they will be like, woo! So Mindy, way to go. Yes. Way to go, Mindy. Uh, I'm so proud of you. So good. Right? I'm so proud of you. I am so proud yes. of you for your podcast and your book sales. Women that are really confident, it's like they have an emotional bucket that's all filled. They have yeah. lots to celebrate. But if people yes. don't, then you'll see women um, not champion. You'll, you'll, you know, and so you'll probably, you probably Do have they failed. criticize? Um, yeah. they either criticize they, or they, they're silence. Uh, ah, yeah. they're, and, it, and yeah. all of a sudden then you, what you realize is like, oh crap, do I have a frenemy here instead of a friend? Yeah. So success is really interesting. I mean, we work with all kinds of very, very successful families and businesses. And this is a theme I hear all the time that as people become more successful, their network gets small, or sorry, their pot, their circle gets smaller, more yep. protective around mill chair. Yep. Their network might get bigger, but their circle gets, and they become more careful of who really gets access. Yep. And so. Yeah. I mean, that's, that really, that sums up my year. Right. For, pretty much. Right. Just really being conscious. Right. Of who I surround myself with um, because I need it for my own yes. emotional support. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And women who are really cha like in that middle chair, they will champion, they will support you. They will cheer yes. you on. They're not threatened by it at all. In fact, they're yeah. so proud of it for you. And so the yeah. question that becomes, I get this asked all the time, then what do you do with friends that we've had for a long time? What do we do with that high school friend that we really have nothing in common with? The values are different, mm -hmm. right? What do you do with that, those friends yeah. in those different seasons? And I think you can have different uh, levels of intimacy in friends. You know, you can have mm. like your, I kind of like see it as like circles, like, like, um, like, that you, you can have your inner core, which people say generally is only about three to five, you know, really, yes. you know, a really tight kind of core. And then, and maybe you're talking to them like, I don't know, once a week, once a day, once a month. And then you can have like other friends that are, you know, they, they serve, you know, it, it's, it, they've got a lot of the values, but maybe not everything. Maybe you're seeing them once, once a quarter. And maybe there's other friends, either you just kind of like drift apart or you see them like once a year. So yes. you can kind of, you can, you don't have to have, and I've had to learn this as I've gone too. We don't have to have everybody in that inner circle or um, like the yeah. inner circle should really be kind of our valley system and our middle chair, yes. but we can have yeah. other friends in our life that, you know, that, um, cause I am a very, I'm an eight on the Enneagram. So I love like the loyalty right. is like huge for me. Right. So, yeah. so you can still have friends in your life, but maybe they're just not in that inner circle. You know, I just did this. Uh, we're putting out a fast like a girl journal that will mm. come out in the um, in the spring of twenty four, and I wanted to put some activity pages in it. Mm. And one of the activity pages 
was one that I learned from a friend of mine going through cancer. And I think it's an incredible tool that everybody should use. And what she did is she realized that the people around her were so important for her healing journey. Yes. That she created what she called the circle of support. Oh, wow. And on the, the core of the circle yes. was her. Yeah. And so she wrote her name. And then all the people uh, closest to her were were the middle chair people. Uh, we didn't have a yeah, language yeah, yeah. for that. But yeah. the people that supported her and and for no matter where she was in the healing journey. Yeah. And then the people that were maybe not understanding, like she was taking a more alternative approach. So the people to her healing, the people that were like, you're crazy, you should be doing this. Or the, or the people that were like, you're going to be fine, like just didn't support her in the way that she wanted. She put them in the outer yes, circle. Yes, yes, yes. And- and do you know she had it in pencil oh, and wow. she would move people around Yes, and she even had her dog in there. Oh. Like it was so beautiful. So we've recreated it for oh, this journal. That's fabulous. That's fabulous. And it's a great, you know what? It's a great visual on how, and I even like pencil because, you know, like I'd be curious, your circles and your, your friendships, where it's all changed in the last year, right? Yeah. Like as your well, success yeah. is just yes. like, woo, right? So You'll yes. see, and you might have some surprises. Some people might really- I did. Did you? Some people might be like really <laughs> showing up. some negative surprises. Yeah, negative surprise. Like, oh, wow. I saw some ugly, I saw some uh, ugly sides of people that yeah. I considered close to me, and I it shocked me. Mm. Um, so I think that's maybe where like the, you know, the downside shows up of yes. growth and success. Yes, yes. So it's a great- visual uh the chairs and it's a great thing to really start for everybody to start thinking about their relationships and be conscious so it's being conscious okay my goal get myself in the middle chair my goal is to try to find other people that are in the middle chair okay great so this leads me to how do you find middle chair people you know it's interesting so i the new york times like i don't know it was like a couple of years ago i think they did an article about friendship and it got so much mm. response that so they actually ended up doing a whole like six part series actually with it because this comes up all the time when I yeah. when I coach and um, I think you have to be very intentional to find your like minded tribe. Yes. So um, so I think you know step one is like okay I now know what the the mill chair is okay so now I've, it's like we're looking for it it's like it's like our, our, our yeah. eye. Well, and also, well, first step actually is we've got to help ourselves get in our middle chair because if we're not in the middle chair, we got to get there. Right. Because if we're not there, even if we find a middle chair, no. they're not going to be, it's not going to be, it's like magnets that just don't Sticky. kind of, yeah, yeah it, won't it, won't, it won't stick. Yeah. So goal number one, get ourselves to the middle chair. Goal number two is then to find other people. So, um, so I think you have to have your radar out for it. And I think you, uh, you have to start looking in different, different circles, right? So whether it's your kid's school, whether it's a church whether it's at the fitness club, whether it's, um, you know, you kind of like go through your different places where everybody's kind of connecting work at your workplace and ask yourself, who are some middle chair people here? Because what's interesting is that if somebody's in that left chair, they're not necessarily looking for people in that right chair. No, they're looking for the, well, right. they're, oh, they're looking, right. aren't they looking for the superiors? They're looking a lot of times if you're in that left chair, you're kind of unconsciously looking for people here or here. Right. Okay. You're not so looking you're not for the looking. middle chair. So what I'm saying yeah. is that like start looking for people who are positive, that are confident, that are like really encouraging. Um, yeah. When I do this in businesses, I mean, you can apply the same thing. When I teach this concept to companies, they, the people love it because they're like, oh, this makes so much sense. So we need a hire in the middle chair and we need to promote in the middle chair. Yes. Like it's like, oh, yes. this is so, because it's so intuitive. Right. So, yes. um, but but now that we have the framework, it's actually really helpful. So a lot of times when people are in this process, they're they're not looking for it. So they miss some really good candidates. Okay, so I love this. And this is so yeah. good because we used when 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 my kids were little, yeah. I remember coming back, I was at the um at the play yard with them. I had taken them to go swing on the swings or something like that. And I came back and I and I had this aha of like I need to find other moms mm. that I like going to the playground with yeah. where our kids can play and I I really enjoy the mom. Yes. And so I started calling it mommy dating. I'm like, <laughs> I'm gonna go mommy dating. I and and it became a joke. And actually some of my best friends today oh. were we mommy dated. Wow. And we found this really beautiful connection. 
So what I'm thinking now, because I also would say that, um, and this is coming out in my in my new book that I'm writing about the brain changes that mm. happen to women after 40. Mm. And one of the things that we uh, that I think is a lot of us just don't get the same juice out of our relationships that we used to get out of them. And so I've been consciously going, I think I'm going to friend date. I got to yes. go find some new friends. Yes. But yes. now I'm going to change it to middle chair. I'm going to go middle chair dating. <laughs> I got to go find all the middle chair people. Yeah. So so that leads me to the question of how long does it take? Like, like how do you know if you found, like sometimes somebody will appear middle chair and yes. then. Yes. Uh, that's true. A couple months in, you're like, ooh, no, right. you're not middle chair. Right. And if that's the case, then so, so think about like, again, when I'm thinking about the audit, right? Like your inner circle and then you have more like, you know, your your kind of community. You can kind of like have these different levels of intimacy. So when we're dating, we don't go from like a date to like intimate, right? We go from- You're getting married. Yeah, we're not, yeah, not all Yeah, not all. Yeah, hopefully not. So, so think of it <laughs> like we're dating. It's like, and you just have to kind of- it's, it is very much like dating, right? You kind of like see, you know, how people show up and how do people respond to your success when you share with the news and are they reliable? And, you know, you, you date and then you're like, okay, I think they're ready to be promoted here. Like this is like, an, I'm, yeah. and the key thing is not to promote too early. Cause I'm, ah. so. <laughs> Cause there's no going back. There's no, it's hard <laughs> to go back. So you have to just kind of like, just do it, you know, but it is like dating, right? Like it is kind of like dating. So I encourage, you know, we're starting a women entrepreneur mastermind for this exact reason, because there's a lot of women. It was interesting when we did our market research for it. And I was asking women entrepreneurs, like what they are struggling with. One of the biggest things they actually said, Mindy, was loneliness. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. It's a big thing. It's a big thing. It's like, they're like, yeah. I don't have and it's any. it's a huge, he- yeah. And it's, it's a huge health ha- ha- yes. ha- problem too. I mean, you die earlier, you get diseases more like loneliness. We need to help loneliness. Right. And for women, uh, you know, I, I, it was so interesting doing the research for it because women are like, I feel like I've got like four heads. My other friends can't relate to me. Um, right. I'm working in a man's world, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, okay, like community is actually one of the things that they're actually really looking for. Um, yeah. And I started, I'm starting, I'm, we're launching it this year because I looked for that and I couldn't find it, you know? So if you can't yeah. find it, so you, you created, created it. it. You create yes. it. You can't find it, you Got create it. it. So, uh, but anyway, all that to say, where can we find it? I would, I would start, I would encourage everybody to look at, look at the areas, your networks right now and ask yourself, is there somebody that maybe you've overlooked? You just haven't really, you know, just haven't, you haven't looked, you maybe, and Go up for coffee. Go do something like a shared interest is really important. Like, so whether or not that is parenting or business or, um, you know, sports clubs or whatever. So, but I would start with the networks that you currently have and ask yourself, are there some middle chair people here? And if not, then expand your network. Does it help if one litmus test that I've always used is how do I feel after I leave that interaction yes. with that person. Yeah. If I, yes. if I can, cause I think it's really seductive, especially when we're choosing friends, mm. if we're sitting in the left chair and we mm. are with somebody in the right chair, all of a sudden we might feel powerful. We might feel like, Oh my God, like I want to be around that certainty. But then when we leave, it's our self talk that happens after we leave. And sometimes if you're taking someone from the left in the right chair, what can end up happening is that you leave and you feel less than again. Yes. So I've used a litmus test of, do I feel better when I leave that interaction yes. with that person? And if so, they seem like a very good person for me to keep interacting with. Right. Mindy, I think that's a really good point. And actually, it's funny because, you know, uh, the litmus test that I use is actually my husband. So, I mean, you've met Brent. Mm. And he yeah. will often comment on when I come back with girlfriends after like a, a girlfriend ah. event. He'll be like, oh, Karen, you're so energized. Like I, and he'll say, yes. sometimes he'll be like, I'm not quite sure about this friendship. He's, and he's like, he'll give it to me. Like he'll say, you know what? I think that friend is a great to you. Or actually, I think you might have a little friend of me on you, on your hands here. Uh, and you know, because he sees it from, there's no emotion, right? Like all he cares yeah. about, it's kind of like his parents, right? Like all we want for our kids is for our kids to have great friends. We don't care if they're popular, yes. what they wear, no. what they're so no, like. We don't, we, don't, we don't care at all. All I care about is are these people really great to my to my kids? 
Yes. That's like, a, that's like a great spouse. A great spouse is like, I don't yeah. care about any oh, bells and whistles, but like, is this person a great friend? And, and I think that's so good. And I, I'm really anxious to hear what people listening to this, like the feedback that we get on this, because it, it takes something as complex as loneliness. So let's go to that thought again. It's like, if you're moving around the world yes. feeling lonely, but maybe a lot of the women that I hear that feel lonely, they actually are surrounded by a lot of people, but they may not be middle chair people. And so they're not getting that same juice from a relationship. So I hope this this context helps those those women figure out how to go choose those those middle chair people. Yes. But the second thing that I'm I'm still left with is that and I see this so much in women as they go through the perimenopausal years is a lot of us have been married a long time. Um, we've changed. Our spouse has changed. Our circumstances have changed. And I'm almost wondering if there's like a yearly on your anniversary, mm. you sit down and you go, okay, what chair do you feel like you're operating from? And if you can do that, then maybe there can be a, a more open discussion. But like, I'm thinking of my friends that have gotten divorced over the last couple of years and every single one of them, one of them was in the right chair and one of them was in, in the left chair. Wow. Wow. Incredible. So how do we, if we're listening to this and we're like, our mar- yeah, I, I don't think my husband or my spouse, my partner is not sitting in the middle chair with me. How do you get them there? So uh, a few things. One, we want to focus 100% on us because right. we can't force somebody to sit in the middle chair, but we can control helping ourselves sit in the middle chair. So that really needs to be the first goal. Like goal number one is I need to get myself in the middle chair. I need to work on my mindset. The book talks about that. I need to work on my mindset. I need to kind of really uh, hone in terms of some meaningful goals that are important to me and really get a handle on these five core skills and who am I? Like that needs to be kind of goal number one. Once we get into that middle chair, what are the things that's going to happen? Our spouse is going to, might be inspired. It's like, whoa, what has happened yeah. to you? You've got like this great energy. You seem happier. You seem fuller. There might be a part of it that is actually more attractive. It's like, mm. it's like a more confident self. So some mm. partners find it actually a little bit, it kind of throws them off, but they're like, mm. I kind of, I think I kind of like this evolution that I'm seeing. So you might mm. be surprised, everybody. You might be surprised if you get yourself in that middle chair your partner might be inspired going, okay, what, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? And I right. think I want to, I want to some of it. So that is right. one option. A second option is they're like, I'm not interested. Right. I'm not interested. And, uh, whatever you're on, I'm not interested to be part of it. So then you have to, you have to have like some really tough conversations with yourself, with them. And, um, and part of it, I think also is I think a lot of times people think, well, I've got to do therapy. I've got to do therapy to kind of get myself to the middle. And you don't have to do therapy. I mean, I do, I mean, you know this, I've been practicing for almost 30 years and leadership development for over 20. One of the reasons actually I would love to go into business, to be honest, Mindy, was because I knew that a lot of people would never go to therapy. They would never come into mm. a, a, my my clinical space, but I could meet yeah. them in the boardroom. <laughs> I could meet them right in the the, therapist went to the the boardroom. That's brilliant. The therapist went into the boardroom and I'm teaching the same stuff, but it's business and strategy development. It's leadership development. It's the same content, but all of a sudden it's like it's framed in a way that they actually kind of understand it. And so I've had, and so, so you don't necessarily have to go into therapy and for a lot of spouses they're not interested and the traditional therapy model doesn't work for most people do you think that somebody could uh, take your ted talk and like maybe take it to a spouse and be like yes let's just watch this together i'd just be curious where you where you sit in the chair like that could be a such a low-hanging fruit it's even i mean your book is easy to read too but it's like that's even easier than reading a book yes i agree date night sit with that yeah ask yourself 100 percent and on our website, we have discussion questions for the TED Talk for three different groups. We have it for families, for schools, mm. and for businesses because yeah. it actually applies to all. And um, I think I told you this story, but for Mother's Day last year, I my um, our boys, we have twin boys that are 16, and they said, what do you want for, for Mother's Day? I'm like, I know what I want for Mother's <laughs> Day. 
I want flowers from the garden. Don't spend any money. And I want us to sit down and watch my own TED Talk and print the discussion <laughs> questions and have a conversation about it. And Mindy, we had an hour conversation with our teenagers about the three chairs. So we watched the TED Talk, which is whatever, 18 minutes. And then we did the discussion questions. And we talked. Okay, so we all did it. And then we talked about what chair we all see ourselves in. And what's really interesting about stress, when we're, okay, where do we see ourselves sitting the majority of time? And then when we're stressed, where do we sit? Right. And, and oh, we, oh, we move in oh, different times. Oh, we can move. Yes. Oh. Yeah. So, so an internal every day then inventory of yes. where am I yes. could be helpful. Yes. That's my stress may have moved me back to yes. that left yes. chair. Yes. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So it's good to, and you know, the people who give us the most honest, raw feedback are our family. They, of course. Right. Unfortunately. Yes. So they see yeah. the best and they see the worst of us. So I think that is a really good, a really good, um, a really good kind of exercise for everybody actually to do. Now, let me ask you this. So if I look at my family unit. Yeah. Um, like your like family, the one I family was of raised origin. In. Your family of origin. My family of yeah. origin. The one yeah. I was raised in. So like back to what I was saying, my sister, and you know, sat in that in that right chair. So there was only one place for me to, me to go. I would go into the left chair or the, the inferior chair. She was in the superior chair. Yeah. I think my mom was in the middle chair. Hmm. And I think my dad was in the superior chair. Hmm. So um, it's really interesting because when we all get together, the family of origin, it's sort of like we all go back into our yes. familiar chairs. Yes. And in this, in recent years, I'm not a allowing myself to sit in that inferior chair in my family of origin. And that's created a little bit of dynamic and a little bit of conflict. Yes. So how do you how do you deal with yes. that when you move a chair in a situation like that? I mean, maybe at Christmas we'll watch your TED talk. My parents would do that, but how, is there are there things you can say if you are moving into this new place and you're finding conflict with those who are used to you in a very specific place? This is oh, Mindy, this is so good. Okay, so this here's a good question to ask yourself: When you're with your family of origin, how old do you feel? Ooh, um, I feel 16. Okay. Okay. So here is your assignment. Okay. When are you seeing your next, when are you seeing the family next Christmas? Well, my, my, my parents, I see every week, Okay, but we'll all be together at Christmas. Okay. So, all right. So my question for you, your homework is to think about what do I need to do to become 54 at Christmas with my family mm. of origin? Because what this happens mm. with a lot of people is that the age that we left home is the age mostly hmm. we stay with our family of origin. Interesting. So people can yeah, kind I of left go, at 17. You left I, at 17. I left at 17. Okay. Now what about yeah. though your sister? When did she leave? How old were you when well, your sister Well, she's two leave? years old. She's two and a half years older than me. So she, so she left, uh, well, she was 18 when she went off to college. So yeah. you were about 16, so she was 18. 15 or 16. Yeah. So basically yeah. you're- But the dynamic we have- Yes. Yeah, the dynamic we have now is that 16 and 18 right. year old. So that's the part that has to get changed. Well, that's what my encouragement. Yeah. Okay, so so you have evolved with your family or actually, okay, so with your mom and dad, how old do you feel? Oh, well, because we're now changing roles a little bit, right? And I have to take care of them. So I probably with them, if it's just the two of them and me, I feel more 54. Okay. Because I'm I'm- having to physically and financially help them got it okay so it's okay so it's when sister comes in all of a sudden the dynamic actually changes so my encouragement to you would be to think to yourself okay if i was emotionally 54 and i'm sitting in that middle chair put yourself in like because you you know people are so habitual right like we tend to say the same yeah. thing like you can almost predict it think about what would you do differently at your christmas holiday what would you say differently what would you do differently how would you respond differently being in that middle chair as a 54 year old yeah I, I you know and I, I there's a lot to that I think what I've done is I think I've gone over I go into the to the superior chair okay. and I'm like okay all of you let me tell you how this you know it's like so I I forgot the middle chair I forgot like the like to just be a little more compassionate and and understanding and 
um, supportive, I could do that a lot better, especially. And, and especially. honestly, that, again, I didn't talk about this at all, but people can flip back and forth. In fact, a lot of times people will be there and they're like, screw this. I'm not doing this anymore. And they're like, Throop. yes. Right. And then it's yep. like, oh, crapola. Throop. Right. So we can kind of do that back and yes. forth. So what you want to do is think to yourself, okay, let's, if I have, if I'm a magician and poof, you know, you're going to be 54 with your family of origin. What would I see you do? What would I see you do? How would I see you act? Uh, how would I see you interact with your sister? What would I, and really try to visualize in your brain what, because so much of you has evolved in all these other parts. And then we just right. got like this little part that is still undeveloped, right? And trust me, right. I've had to do this in my own family of origin too, because I'm the youngest of three kids yeah. and all kinds of different, you know, sibling relationships uh, for sure as well. But one of the things that I did is like, mm, nope, I'm not going to play this dance anymore. And when I yeah. stopped playing the dance, you know, stuff hit the fan and it did not necessarily. And we have to kind of wait for, because if we're not going to put up with stuff anymore and we're going to start setting boundaries. So setting boundaries is another huge piece I was just going to say, uh, yeah, okay. I've got, and speaking up maybe for myself yes, in, okay. a, in a kind way. Yes. So being assertive is a huge part to this. This is, again, when, when people get this scorecard, it kind of like downloads all these different things. But people in the middle chair, they, um, they're they assertive. They will start standing up for themselves. And if you're in a family of origin, they're like, whoa, what is that? That's that's actually going to create conflict. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it is, yeah. Right? It's like, it is what it yeah, is. Yeah. I you know, know, but we can say, we can be assertive with grace and kindness. And yeah, and no nonsense, right? So yeah. learning how to be assertive and to set boundaries is a huge part. And if we're part of a family of origin and we haven't done that before, it gets worse before it gets better. Is what I would say. Yeah. Well, yeah, but you know, my the thing I love about all my whole family is they're very much open into improve self improvement. Okay. And um, intellect is very important in my family, studying, understanding. So I'm literally going to, we're going to watch your TED talk at, a talk at Christmas <laughs> and I'll report back yes. and I'll be like, okay, no, I'm going to report back. I think this, I think you may have just solved our, our, my family of origin problem because I think if I could have a, a very interesting, clear conversation with them after we have a common language, then- yes. They, I think they, we would all understand each other better. A hundred percent. And honestly, Mindy, that is actually one of the things that we hear over and over again from people is they love the chairs because it's now a language. It's super yes. easy to te uh, understand it. I mean, it's a lot more complex when we actually start going into like, how do you build it, blah, blah, blah. But understanding it is great. People can then also have a conversation, right? So yes. all of a sudden, because like, how would you bring this up if you're like, you know, past the turkey and it's right. like, right, I don't know. How do I bring this up? It's kind of awkward, like, right? Hey. Yeah. Where's the cranberry <laughs> yeah. sauce? You're in the left chair. <laughs> yeah. Pass I'm the cranberry the sauce and like, what chair are you in? So it kind <laughs> of like gives people language. <clears throat> and then if you go through the questions, it actually helps people talk about what chair do I see myself in? And what chair do you see me in? Yes. And when have I been in the right chair? When have I been in the middle chair? When have I been in the left chair? I think it opens up like some fascinating conversations. Yeah. And actually one of the things, and again, I'm, I don't know if, how many of your listeners have done the Enneagram. You and I have talked about this, but I'm an eight. Yeah. An eight yes. uh, tend to confront things. Yes. And as a woman, eight, as a female, eight, that is interesting because uh, sometimes that gets perceived as aggressiveness. Yes. Versus assertiveness. Yes. And they're big, there's a, we haven't even talked about this, but in terms of communication, to be sitting in that middle chair, you're going to be assertive. You're not going to put up with everything. Mm. You are going to stand mm. up for yourself. And that could yes. be perceived as the right chair. Yes. Yes. And so yeah. it's helpful for people to really understand, no, assertive is different than aggressive. And I really like the way you say of instead of w w like watching the TED talk or reading the book and being like, hey, this is the chair I'm in. What chair are you all in? Yes. I think what I'm hearing you say is you would ask, like, what chair do you think I'm in? Where do where do you think we all fit? And then that just that would be a middle chair person opening up the conversation. Exactly. And that might yeah. be your first feeling of like, OK, I think I'm going to I'm going to charge this. I'm going to I'm going to take the lead yeah. on this and be 54 with my family because that would be a 54 yeah. move 
my gosh, I love this. I, I'm thinking of all the, <laughs> the good thing about the, so many people in my life right yeah. now is they're always there. I've surrounded myself with growth mindset people. And so I'm going to take this and be like, hey, let's deepen our re relationship. Like what chair are you in in our relationship? I think it'll be really, really cool. And so. you can kind of like, yeah, and it just, it, 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 it will just open up the dialogue. All of a sudden you have like this common language. We should talk really quick yeah. also about communication because that was the other thing that you talked about that I think is really, really sure. important. About, and again, you'll, people will see this on the scorecard, but in conflict, and this is the eight talking, but in conflict, you can... You can often tell where people sit based on conflict with what chair they're sitting in. Okay. So if oh, there's a, it reveals it. It reveals it. It's actually one of the clues. Okay. So oh. if somebody's in that left chair and there's, so let's say you and I are friends, Mindy, and you do something that really upsets me. I have pretty much three options of how I'm going to respond to you. If I'm in that left chair, I'm not going to go talk to you. Yeah. I'm going to keep it to myself. I might blame myself. I might um, think, oh my goodness, I'm like at fault, I'm a terrible friend, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to go talk to you, but I might go talk to Connie. And now what I've done is I've just created a triangle. Oh, triangulation. Triangulation Ooh, is so, that. Tox so toxic, toxic, toxic. And we see triangulation so in the workplace. We see triangulation in families. We see triangulation in friendships. And it's toxic because now I'm not honoring you behind your back. I'm disrespecting yes. you. You don't even know that I'm upset and I'm talking yes. about you to somebody else. Yes. So it's so toxic. So well said. Okay. So that's, so, toxic. so that is passive aggressive or, um, triangulation. People in that right chair, they tend to be very aggressive. You're the problem. You're at fault. They tend to use language of you. You're wrong. Mm. You're the problem. So the yeah. word you and they blame. Mm. So I will, okay. and a lot of times that I might bring a whole bunch of other people kind of with me. Okay. We see this a little okay. bit with, oh, yeah. we see a little bit more certainly with kids and teenagers, but we still see it in the adult, in the adult place as well. In the, oh yeah. Yeah. In the workplace. Yeah, the workplace. Yeah. Okay. So we see it in, pol we actually yes. see it in politics yes. Yes. here in, uh, in the United States. You know what? States. That is yes. well said. You know what? Trust me when I watch, cause I watch your news every night. What I see yeah. in terms of the news, I'm filtering it through where you, like I have a pretty good sense. I think about where people actually sit, what chair do they actually sit in? What? You just have to, you know, once you kind of know the language, you kind of know with what to look for. But, yes. oh, yeah, the person in that right chair, they bring their groupies with them oh, yeah. to make them feel really tough. Okay. And then they yeah. they, they cancel anybody else. Yes. They cancel culture. Oh, yeah. Every, yeah, yeah. Anybody else. Totally. They're like, nope, yes. you're not my friend. Yes, yeah. yes. They will kind of, they will Ooh. literally kind of get rid of everybody else. The person in that middle chair, so, again, if you're my friend and you've done something I'm going to have the courage to go up to you. I'm going to, I'm going to say, you know, Mindy, can we like, let me know when you've got like a little bit of time to chat. I'm going to keep it one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not going to talk about it with anybody else. And I will be assertive. And the key word with assertive is I, I think I yeah. feel I need, this is how I see it. How do you see it? And so I will stand up for myself, but it's a conversation. Mm, that's so well said. This is how I see it. How do you see this it? This is how I see it. How do you that's, see it? Ah. Uh, it's so such a, 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 a compassionate way to handle a conflict Well, like that. and the focus will be on problem solving. Like, this is the issue. Yes. Here's how I see it. How do you see it? Uh, how can we solve this together? Yeah. Okay, so right. that yeah. is, uh, but what's interesting as an eight female on the Enneagram, even though I try as best as I can to do that, with other women, not men, but with other women, I will sometimes get perceived as aggressive. Yeah. Because just yeah. because I'm standing up for myself, it's like, oh, that's aggressive. I'm like, no, actually, that's not aggressive. It's being assertive and it's actually setting boundaries. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a whole nother discussion because I think that part of the patriarchal world that we live in yeah. is not used to women standing up like yes. that. And I, and I, I can't, I, I watch this really acutely lately about how men are quick to, to, to brag about themselves. I'll even see it here on this podcast mm. when I'm interviewing mm. like men who might be putting a book out. They have no qualms about just like, this is who I am. I'm amazing. And they are, and here's my book and I'm, everybody needs it. And they're just super clear. Whereas women will tend to be a little more like, you know, I, I wrote this book. If it's helpful, you might like it. Right. Like, you know, but if a book stands, a woman stands right. up and is like, Hey, this is my book. It's amazing. I'm, you're, you tend to be 
conditioned to be like, well, wow, aren't you yeah. bold? Yeah. So I yeah. do think there's something in, in, in the patriarchal world that women have, have learned to sit in that left chair because the, the, so many men, and I don't know if you've ever done studies on this, if women, more women sit in the right than compared to the left. Mm -hmm. And so if they go to try to even set boundaries in the middle, they can feel like they've come across as the, the right chair person. And they might feel a hundred percent and they might, they will get a different response from women, um, versus men. Yes. So yes. men will be like, yeah. and I think that's kind of why I, as a teenager, I actually had a lot of my closest friends were guys because I didn't like yes. the drama. Oh my I'm gosh. like, like yes, I'm not into in drama. I'm like, and you know what's funny, Mindy, me a lot too. of my closest girlfriends now, my inner circle, when we were in New York for the weekend and celebrating my early 50th that's coming up and uh, we were talking Woo. about, we were talking about friendship and that's actually one of the things a lot of my closest girlfriends now that is a common thread is that none of us did girl drama. We all, almost yeah. all of us had really got great guy friends and, and that, but it's tricky. Having a lot of guy friends works really great until you get married. And then you're like, oh, this, yeah. this, I don't think this is going to work anymore. Yeah. I got to think I got to change my paradigm yeah. a little bit. So, because yeah. men won't care about that. Yeah. So I, I, I would say all my closest friends would say the same thing. All okay. they, they always have gravitated more to, to men than women because they don't do the drama. So and yeah, there's so many places. I just want to say thank you for the three chair analogy. I, I really think something tangible like that helps us navigate something as untangible yes. that as relationships. So for starters, this is brilliant. And I hope everybody shares this episode out and like, keeps the conversation going because it's even in the time we've been talking, you've given me some clarity on things I've been really thinking about over the last week. So, so thank awesome. you for that. And before I ask you the last question, tell me how you tell everybody how they find you. You have this women's entrepreneurial mastermind. They can join if they feel moved to do that. You have your book, your Ted talk, where do they find you? Uh, so two places, uh, Instagram is great at Dr. Karen, uh, Gordon and Karen is with a Y everybody. So, uh, sometimes yes, you might be actually yeah. looking for Karen with an E. So, uh, Dr. Karen Gordon, Karen with a Y on Instagram and, um, and our website dkeleadership.org. We've got all kinds of different courses and um, different resources for both organizations and families. That's that's who we serve. Yeah. We serve both. And we really try to teach leadership development that you can apply to all parts of your life, uh, which people yeah. like. I find people just want tools that you can oh. apply to all parts of our life. And that's what that's really with what we do. Yeah. And I will tell you that, our, you, you know, just to fill everybody else in, that our whole team is going through your DK leadership mm. uh, work right now. And um, the course that they're on and the feedback we're getting is uh, is amazing. Everybody's like, hey, if you haven't gone on to this course, this isn't just about business, this is about life. And everybody's really excited about it. So, yeah. So thank you. I really appreciate that. Okay, my here's my last question. Okay. And this is this one. I'm so curious what you're going to say because I know you well. What's your super, what's your superpower? What superpower do you bring to the world? Ooh, superpower. That's a good question, Mindy. What is my superpower? I think my, when I think about the, the work that I do, it is like, I can, I can see, I can see vision. Yeah. I see vision. Like when I start working, whether it's with a person or a team or a family or a couple, I don't see where they're at. I see where they can be. Ooh, that's like, good. I kind oh, of like, I kind of like, yeah. uh, you know, my hobby, you know, this, my hobby is interior design. I love, so give me like a crappy old house that's falling apart. And I'm like, I know what I can do. And so I do that yeah. on my hobby. I can kind of go in and just, it's like taking stuff down and putting things back and let's re. And so I do that on a design just kind of for fun for my personal side. But from my work side, I think I really do the same thing. Like when we start working with people, people feel totally overwhelmed. They feel totally insecure. They feel, they're like, oh my, I don't even know where to start. Like they, they just feel so depleted. And I'm like, it's okay. Like I, I see where you can go and I know the steps you need to take. So yeah. just like, I'm going to take I, you by I, the yes. hand and I'm going to show you that the That is path. your superpower. And I feel yep. like- that, it yeah. yeah. And it just gives hope to people. Right. Like I'm like, yeah. I'm, and so I think that would be my superpower because, um, we work with some really tricky situations, really tricky teams, really mm -hmm. tricky families. 
And I've just done this for so long. I know, I know kind of with what works. Um, and I think just in that creating a safe place for people to be really vulnerable, I think. Yeah. Um, so that, I think that's my superpower. It's a good question. I've never I, been I asked would, that before. I would agree. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think we all have a superpower and we don't highlight it enough. And so I really, and I find people's superpower really interesting. It's something that actually, and maybe why I asked this question, it's something that I think about when I'm interacting with somebody okay. is like, what's their superpower? Because I always want to learn from people. Yeah. So I just have to say thank you oh, so much thank for you. being here. Thank you so much, yeah. Mindy. This has been so this fun. Great. I know. So I fun. Know. And I'll, I'll see you in a couple weeks yes, in Arizona. Exactly. Yeah, amazing. Beautiful. Thanks so much, Mindy. Love you.